what do you think are some of the early warning signs that someone's been eating too much sugar? Well, first of all, they will say to you, oh, I have a horrible sweet tooth. And how many people do you know who say that? In fact, virtually all of them. That's sugar addiction till proven otherwise. Now, the reason they'll say I have a horrible sweet tooth is because sugar addiction is not socially unacceptable. It is perfectly reasonable. And in fact, when people say, oh, I have a horrible sweet tooth, they're looking for, you know, codependence and enablers is what they're doing. The fact of the matter is that because sugar is not associated with violent crime, it's okay to be a sugar addict. You know, let's think of other addictive substances that don't lead to violent crime. Caffeine. It's okay to be a caffeine addict. Um, oh, and by the way, that's my drug of choice. And, you know, if you take my Starbucks away from me, I might have to kill you. So, you know, it, it makes itself manifest in different ways. But in fact, sugar addiction is extremely common. One of the issues is that the, ab the aberrant behaviors only come during the withdrawal phase. But the fact is, because sugar is so prevalent in all of our food, since 73% of the items in the American grocery store are spiked with added sugar for the food industry's purposes, not for you, you never actually have withdrawal. So you don't get to see the altered mental state of the sugar addict during withdrawal. You mentioned like just saying, hey, I have a sweet tooth can be an early sign of eating too much sugar or being addicted to sugar. From a physical standpoint, what are some of the signs that you may be having acute withdrawal symptoms or you're just you're addicted to sugar, but you don't eat, you're not even aware of it. You could potentially think it's something else. So sugar actually doesn't have that many obvious direct withdrawal symptoms. So let, let's let's define addiction. All right. Prior to 2013. You needed two phenomena, two behavioral phenomena, to be an addictive substance. You had to demonstrate both tolerance, that is more and more for less and less, and that's because of downregulation of the dopamine receptor in the reward center of the brain, because dopamine downregulates its own receptor. Virtually all neurotransmitters downregulate their own receptors, and there's a reason for that. It's because Dopamine is excitatory. Dopamine excites the next neuron. Now, neurons like to be excited. Neurons like to be stimulated. That's why they have receptors. But neurons like to be tickled, not bludgeoned. Chronic overstimulation of any neuron will lead to neuronal cell death because the amount of energy it takes to fire is greater than the amount of energy it can burn at any one time. So if you have continuous firing, you will become energy depleted and you risk dying. Now we know that because we have kids in the neurologic intensive care unit with chronic you know, seizure disorders, status epilepticus, nonstop seizing, and we have to stop their seizures or they will lose neurons and they will end up becoming developmentally delayed and severely uh, um, uh, compromised. So it behooves us to get the neurons to calm down. Well, if you are constantly plying them with dopamine, they only have one way to calm down and that is to reduce the uh, number of receptors. So they downregulate their own receptor so that there's less chance that any given dopamine molecule will find a receptor to bind to. More and more for less and less. The law of diminishing returns. That's tolerance. And every addictive substance, and for that matter, every addictive behavior, does the same thing. It increases dopamine, which reduces the dopamine receptor. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, prior to 2013, the American Psychiatric Association said that for something to be addictive, you also had to demonstrate withdrawal. Now, withdrawal is very interesting because if you look at the symptoms of withdrawal for any of the 
chemicals that we know have withdrawal. So heroin, cocaine, nicotine, they all have systemic effects when there's withdrawal. So the GI side effects of morphine, the medriasis and the uh, sweating of, um, of cocaine, et cetera. The, these are all outside of the brain side effects, all right? Sugar does not have those. Behaviors do not have those, but they're still addictive. Gambling does not have those, but they're still addictive. So in 2013, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, number five, they rewrote the definition of addiction. So it can be tolerance and withdrawal, or it can be tolerance and dependence. And dependence are all internal effects. Like, for instance, can't stop thinking about it, motivated to go seek it, you know, uh, gets in the way of, uh, you know, being able to function in society, um, you know, uh, uh, alters your work habit and your sleep schedule, things like that. That's dependence. Now, sugar does not have tolerance and withdrawal. It has tolerance and dependence. So under the 2013 rubric, sugar is addictive. So those are the symptoms that one sees with sugar addiction. When we talk about sugar, I think it's important to kind of define what we're talking about here because I think people will then look at anything that has sugar in it, whether it be like fruit or anything like that, and compare it to a candy bar. And I think what what I gather what you're talking about is really like these processed foods that have added sugar in them is what you're referencing when it comes to sugar addiction, like most people, I mean, I mean, not I haven't seen anybody just take a table, like a, a spoon, and just eat sugar out of a jar. It's not. It's it's the hyper. It's the hyper processed foods. Exactly. You're absolutely right. So let's be very clear. First of all, let's define what I mean by sugar. You, you, you yourself said we need to do that, and I agree. So sugar, dietary sugar, sucrose table sugar, cane sugar, beet sugar, the stuff you put in your coffee, the crystals that you spoon out and, you know, add them to your tea or your coffee or whatever. Okay. That is sucrose. That is one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose bound together. That's what that is. The fructose molecule is the sweet molecule. The glucose molecule is not all that sweet. Glucose would be like molasses. Now, Doug, do you like molasses? I don't, I could, couldn't really tell you. I've never really had it, I don't think. You know, I mean, it might be good in a certain kind of cookie, but you know, you don't see people going around chugging caro syrup, do you? No. Okay. You don't see people going around chugging glucola. You know, I mean, there's no black market for glucola. Okay. That's glucose. Doesn't taste that good. And the reason is because glucose does not stimulate the reward center. The sweetness index of the glucose molecule is only 0.74 compared to sucrose, which is 1.0. And it does not stimulate the reward center. So glucose is eh, not that interesting. Fructose is the other molecule. And fructose is very interesting. <laughs> fructose is the molecule we seek. Fructose is the addictive molecule. Fructose is the one that stimulates the reward center, the nucleus accumbens. And it's been shown on neuroimaging, you know, that this is the case. Now, glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that you, if you don't consume it, your body makes it. It's called gluconeogenesis. You can turn amino acids into glucose, you can turn fat into glucose. But fructose, there is no biochemical reaction in the human body or in any animal cell, for that matter, on the planet that requires dietary fructose for any reaction. It is completely vestigial to all animal life on this planet. Okay? Nobody needs it. 
contrary to what the food industry says. They say, oh, well, you need sugar to live. Bullshit. <laughs> Just garbage. You do not. All right. If you, you if you need glucose, you can make it, and you don't need fructose under any circumstance. Need it. All right. But it's sweet. It's got a sweetness index of 1.73 compared to sucrose at one. Okay, so it's very sweet. And we love it because it stimulates the reward center. But it's not necessary. And in chronic doses, in high chronic doses, it causes cellular damage and ultimately cell death and ultimately human death. So, Doug, can you name a substance that is not necessary for life, that no biochemical reaction in the body requires it, that when consumed in excess causes cellular and human damage and death, and we love it anyway, and it's addictive? Uh, alcohol. Alcohol. That's right. Alcohol is completely unnecessary, yet alcohol is loved by millions and alcohol is addictive. But we don't need it. But we have it. And, you know, if you know how to consume it, you can manage it. But a lot of people can't. 20% of humans are, are either binge drinkers or chronic alcoholics. Same with sugar. And the reason is because sugar and alcohol are metabolized in the cell the same way. They are virtually identical. The big difference between sugar and alcohol is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step of metabolism, which we call glycolysis. For sugar, we do our own first step. After that, the cell handles them exactly the same. The cell doesn't care where it came from. So that's why children now get the diseases of alcohol without alcohol. Type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease were the diseases of alcohol. Now they're the diseases of five-year-olds. And the reason is because they have an alcohol substitute. It's called sugar. And so I guess to bring this back to what we were talking about in the beginning, so sugar can be addictive, as you've said, and we're talking about processed foods when we're talking about sugar and the, how they're added into foods, etc. And while it can be addictive, it's not to the same extent as things like cocaine, heroin, alcohol, like as far as like people aren't destroying their lives to get these substances, but doesn't mean that it's not addictive. And the reason is because sugar does not have withdrawal. Right. Substances that have withdrawal exhibit altered behaviors in the withdrawal state where people ruin their lives. So for cocaine, alcohol, heroin, nicotine, you know, uh, 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 we have those. Sugar is tolerance and dependence. So in, in, in the same way, uh, uh, you know, um, caffeine is with, has withdrawal, but it doesn't ruin lives. So just because, it, you know, something's addictive doesn't mean you ruin lives, but you can ruin your health. And also, I think like when somebody's under the influence of something like alcohol, it's ruined a lot of relationships. You know, it, ca it can cause death from drinking and driving. It can, it can also ruin your life while under the influence where you know, people aren't destroying marriages from eating too many cookies. However, like you said, it can de certainly destroy their health. How does like this, the, the cycle of sugar addiction and tolerance work? Like the way I'm thinking of it as just somebody who's a former drug addict is if somebody eats like, you know, a pint of ice cream consistently for two weeks, are they now moving on to two pints, three pints? Like how does this all work for somebody? Well, the fact of the matter is that, um, uh, sugar generates more sugar craving. Um, you know, this is well known. This is work that my colleague, Dr. Nicole Avina did. Uh, she is a uh, professor of neuroscience at Mount Sinai, and she is the one who demonstrated that sugar is addictive in both animals and in humans. So there are four criteria in animals for demonstrating addiction, tolerance, cravings, externalities. So externalities mean other things happen because you are consuming. And in animals, uh, that means cross-sensitivity with other drugs of abuse. So if you, for instance, 
uh, take a, um, a rat and you addict them to sugar and then expose them to amphetamine, you get a hyper response because they've, they're already addicted and vice versa. So there's only one reward system. There's only one dopamine system and any of these substances can alter it. And so if you're addicted to one thing, you're addicted to all of them. And so when you try to remove one of the, those, that, the thing that you're addicted to, okay, you end up transferring that addiction to other things. This is known as addiction transfer. And this is why when people stop smoking, they start drinking. And when people stop drinking, they start eating. Okay. And vice versa. So there are several patients that some of them famous like Carney Wilson, who were massively obese, had bariatric surgery and then became chronic alcoholics afterwards. And the reason was because when they had their bariatric surgery, they weren't uh, generating that reward signal from food anymore. And they had to generate that reward signal somehow.